Um, yeah, so now we will start our, our message for this evening. I hope all of you have uh, been enjoying the Sabbath till now and feel uh, privileged, feel happy, feel delighted to spend the Sabbath. Uh, I hope everyone can hear me clearly and you can see the presentation so we can, I think we will uh, move forward with our topic. So the topic for this evening is something related to the mark of the beast. So of course the mark of the beast is mentioned in Revelation chapter 13. And so we will be looking at the text in Revelation chapter 13. Before we proceed with our message, I'd like all of us to bow our heads in prayer. Let's pray. Our most kind and gracious Father in heaven, we ask that you will be with us as we spend some time with your word. Help us understand your message for us this evening. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So when we look at where the mark of the beast is mentioned, it is mentioned in Revelation 13, verses 16 and 17. And we read verse 16, which says, And he causeth all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads. And verse 17 says, And that no man might buy or sell, save he that had the mark, the name, or the name of the beast, or the number of his name. Some other translation would render it a little different, where they say something like, uh, say that he, uh, that had the mark, which is the name and the number of his name. But nevertheless, we can see that this is what Revelation 13, 16, and 17 say now in relation with our with our topic today we have to consider something about habits let us think about let each one of us think about what kind of habit patterns do we have because that is something very much uh, very much in very very much uh, in line with our topic for today and I'm sure in these times, many people are worried about what the mark of the beast is. Has the mark of the beast come? Or do we have to wait for something else? Or are many people deceived today? But let us focus or let, let us think about habit. What kind of habit patterns do you have? You understand that uh, we, we all know that habit makes character. And so uh, how, how does a habit form? A habit forms because we do certain activities, certain things every day, and that is how a habit forms. So it is something that's repeated again and again, and then finally to the extent where it is difficult to forget. Now, something similar to this happens where? It happens when there's chiseling when 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 someone has to carve something on a rock they have to do it again and again and after they do it again and again is it easy for them to just simply remove it no it is not easy for someone to just remove a carving or, or something from a stone or even remove uh, the impress on a coin it is difficult and if you try to remove the impress, you are removing the stone itself. You're removing the metal itself. And so it is very difficult to remove an engraving that is on a stone. And that is something related to what we are discussing today. And we will see. Before we get into Revelation 13, we have to understand that Revelation can be divided into seven parts. And these are the seven parts Revelation can be divided into. And the part that we are focusing on is part four, the end time message. And that is at the center of Revelation. 
All the other parts are some things that are related to the topic, but aren't really aren't really the center. The center is here from verse from chapters ten to fourteen. So when we look at this section of Revelation, we find that uh, this this end time message is present in Revelation ten to fourteen, and Revelation fourteen twelve to fourteen is inseparable. It is dangerous when we are studying Revelation to separate chapter 12 from chapter 13 and 14. It goes together. When we are studying about the woman, we have to study about the beast. We study about the beast, we have to study about the woman. And also we need to study about the 144,000. It goes together because as we know, the Bible is not written with chapters in mind, but is written as one as, as, or each book was written as a book as a whole, not with chapters in mind. Uh, especially the book of Revelation in, in context to what we're discussing. So firstly, let us look at the mark. Now the mark, uh, the mark in this chapter has a Greek word, karagma. And this is, there are many words that are used to talk about a mark, a seal and so on. But this, this word is a very special word and it is used according to Ranko Stefanovic. It is used in you know, when when it's used when you're trying to say that something is imprinted, engraved, and even sometimes even used to describe a graven image. So this this term is used technically uh, when you're when there's a stamp from the government or something commercial or the impress on coins and also used for branding animals. But, on the, but when you're looking at human beings, the practice of branding slaves with a mark, they use another word. So it is very strange that when you look at this chapter here, that, it is, that this word is used to talk about human beings. And the, the word mark is something that is related to humans. So we have we can think about that and understand it. And of course, this word is also used in Galatians 6, uh, 17, the word stigmata is used there. But when you look at the word mark here in this chapter, it uses the word karagma. So we have to think about that. That's why I mentioned about chiseling in the beginning. It is this this mark is, is an impress. It is, it is an engraving, it is a carving. Although, although what we're gonna see next is something in the Old Testament, it is somehow related to what we find here. Of course, much study must be given to actually link it properly to this text. But uh, as we can see, as we can see here in Jeremiah 17:1. We can see that God says to Jeremiah that the sin of Judah is written with a pen of iron and with a point of diamond. It is graven upon the table of their heart and upon the horns of your altars. So the horns of the altar is supposed to do with worship. And if you read the chapter, it talks about how they build, how they carve graven images and worship them and do not worship God at all. And so we can see here in chapter 17, when it talks about the sin of Judah, the people are not very good. They're rebellious and they're believing lies and not obeying the voice of God. So that has something to do with the mark. Not only that, when we look at, when we look at Deuteronomy 6, 4 to 8, we can find that Moses is talking about something important. This is the end message before he leaves the people and here, he declares, he says, hear, listen, O Israel, the Lord, which is the word Yahweh, our God is one Yahweh. And this is a very big declaration. It's not very clear when you look at it just like that. But basically, here, Moses is trying to say that God is one. He is united. He, is, he, he has one purpose. And he knows what he's doing. He is, not, he is not someone who, who 
uh, just simply does everything haphazardly. But he's someone who is united and who is one and who is focused. And of course, we know that God is three persons in one. And so it highlights who God is, the character of God himself. So here, uh, Moses is trying to declare and say that Israel should hear the character of God, should listen and understand God himself. Not only that, but they must love the Lord, their God, with all their heart, with all their soul, and with all their might, with their everything. And these words, uh, Moses commanded them. And as we read on, we see that Moses says that when you, in, in all your life, when you sit, when you rise up, in everything that you do, you must remember these words, these words that Moses was declaring. And of course, it kind of includes whatever Moses has written. And at the at, in verse 8, Moses says, And thou shalt bind them for a sign upon thine hand, and they shall be as frontlets between thine eyes. So here we can see that Moses is giving in some importance that whatever Moses is declaring here, or at least the Shema, which is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, he is one Lord, and about loving the Lord with all their heart, soul, and might. That is something that they are supposed to keep where? Upon their hand and uh, between the front lips of their eyes, which is where? where? Where is that? That is on the foreheads. So we can see here that in Deuteronomy, Moses is declaring something like that. So to declare that a sign is there upon the, or the mark is there upon the hand or forehead is not something new to the Bible. Ezekiel also has something where God himself is putting a seal upon the head. So now let's go to the number. The number is the part which many people are, when many people argue about and many people are also uh, uncertain about. Who, what is this number? Where, who does it, point towards. Now, when we look at the text, we can see this is what we get from the text. The text declares in the later verses, in verse 18, uh, the text declares that the number should be understood with wisdom. The number, also the text declares that the number in some form or way must be counted or must be reckoned with. Uh, and thirdly, the text declares that the Context seems to suggest, uh, of course, yeah, this is Ranko Stefanovic uh, commented that, of course, when you look at Revelation, the context of this number, uh, in, in the context of Revelation, we can find that they had the ability to understand this number. But the thing is, nowadays, we do not know how they understood this number to be. But what we are sure is that this number did not mean anything during their time in the sense it, it did not refer to Nero as some people might consider. And also we can see that the number that is there uh, is 666. It is not 666. You know, there's a difference, right? You write 666 is different from 666. That is how it is there in the Bible. Uh, now, when you look at Adventists, Adventists have various or view different things about this number, most popular and kind of something that is very easily supported is the term that vicarious Philly Day is something related to this number. Through the process of Gemartia, we can easily find, uh, we like count, count the letters of, uh, yeah, count the letters of these words and then come to the conclusion that these numbers add up to 666. Uh, but, and also related to that, we find that this term is used uh, for the Pope in the forged document, the donation of Constantine. And this document played a very important role in history because it gave power to the papacy. But later on, it was found out that it was fake, but can't do anything about that now when it has already done its damage. 
uh, and the and the papacy still stressed their authority after it was found to be fake. And uh, some would like to view that this number is merely a, merely symbolic of rebellion and corruption, because whatever whatever this beast is doing is not anything good. It is something that is evil, something that is against God. In fact, if you look at the beginning of the chapter, blasphemy is something that is characteristic of whatever these beasts are trying to do. And what dragon-like also. Uh, we can also understand that the number is linked, or some people like to understand that the number linked to some Babylonian practices, some amulets and things like that have these kind of numbers, which kind some some amulets have certain boxes where the numbers that were there on it added to 666. But we do know that the Babylonian new, numerical system is based on 60, not six, it's based on 60. And that's why we, when you look at Daniel, you find that Daniel, the image is measured in, in 60s. Uh, so, Next, we can see, or some people like to consider that the number is a counterfeit of the number seven, which we know means fullness, means wholeness. And that's also interesting. Some people like to point out that the duration of the persecution of the beast is what? Three and a half years, which is a half of seven. So it's not complete. Seven is complete. Three and a half years is not complete. That's also, when you look at Jesus' life, it was three and a half years. It wasn't complete. In the midst of seven days, it was cut short. Another thing from the text is that it is a human number. It is a number of man. So it has to do something with man. And so uh, we see that, yeah, of course, when you look at the chap or the chapters that come later on in 17 and 18, Babylon is mentioned a lot. And has many of the similar characteristics to the first beast, the beast from the sea, and does many of the things that they do and attracts the whole world, all the merchants to itself. So Revelation kind of gives a clue, but doesn't really directly say who, who, who this number, or who the numbers, like exactly the name or anything like that. But Revelation is very sure about the fact that whatever this power is doing in 13 is definitely related to whatever, whatever it declares about Babylon in the future in, in chapter 17 and 18. So that's what we find here. The number is in relation to Babylon of Revelation 17. So whatever, whatever this beast is trying to do, whatever these two powers are trying to do, these beasts, both the beast from the land and the beast from the sea are trying to do is related to the character of Babylon itself. Now, why is it important to remember that it is about character? Because when you look at the name, name in the Bible has something to do with character. Uh, and many times when you see, like, for example, even the name of Jesus, uh, Jesus was given the name because he will save his people from their sins. Um, and Abel also has a name which, mean, uh, which means breath. And we know that his life was cut short. And Noah means rest. We find his example that uh, the world was brought to rest in his time. And there was peace, kind of a symbol of sin being eradicated. But we can see here that name is something related to character. And the name is linked with 666. It is linked with Babylon. And it could refer, yeah, like we can see, it could refer to the Babylon, uh, refer to Babylon, the mother of harlots. And it is in contrast with what is mentioned in chapter 14. And that is why it is important to study all of them together and not separate them as two separate things. Because if we see in chapter 14, the name of the father is written on the foreheads of the 144,000. And so we can see, uh, we, can, we can understand uh, this fact. 
So when 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 we look at when we look at this number, yeah, when you look at the name here, it has something to do with character. So when when we look at now, try to understand the identity of this of six hundred and sixty six. Uh, we can we can. Uh, we can know for sure that whatever whatever is going to happen in the future uh, is more clearly revealed or declared in the spirit of prophecy. The Bible has stated many things that will happen in the end, but it is a spirit of prophecy that has clearly outlines a major thing that will happen in the end. So we can see that the identity of whoever this person is or whoever this organization is, is exclusively given with clarity in the spirit of prophecy. It's not like the Bible isn't declared, but when you look at the spirit of prophecy, the spirit of prophecy clearly declares what's going on. The spirit of prophecy clearly declares the power of the papacy in the end. The spirit of prophecy clearly declares the role of America in the end, which is not clearly declared in the Bible in the sense it's not it's not directly said okay I mean like America is not mentioned in the Bible it is it is all in symbols but Ellen White clearly declares or the spirit of prophecy clearly declares this and what is it declared it declares that the mark is linked with the enforcement of Sunday sacredness so anything that is not related to Sunday sacredness is not the mark of the beast. Next, the authority that, uh, yeah, that this, this is the authority that takes responsibility to enforce the law uh, in alliance with, uh, is, is, an, is the alliance between America and the papacy. So when America and the papacy join together and try to enforce the law, uh, they, they are the ones who are the authority behind whatever is going to happen? Third, and next, we understand that the papacy claims sole authority of Sunday sacredness. The papacy does declare, and we know it, we're familiar with it, that the papacy does say that it has changed the sanctity of the Sabbath to Sunday and so on, or uh, things like that. So we know that the papacy does declare its authority. So next we understand from the spirit of prophecy that Sunday sacredness is related to the mark only in the end times. Not that other people are not guilty if they see the, see the truth of the Sabbath and don't follow, but as something that is uh, to the whole world, something global, Sunday sacredness is only related to the mark in the end time. Uh, right now, Sunday sacredness is not the global uh, dis deciding factor of uh, the mark of the beast, which means if someone keeps Sunday today, that does not necessarily mean they have the mark of the beast, but it will soon be a deciding factor. So some of the things that are, we're not going to go to everything, it's just a few things that have been declared by spirit of prophecy. In 1850, this is quite early. Remember when when did when did the church begin? Of course, it started in 1844, and then officially the church began to uh, began to join together in around 1850. So it is quite early because it's written in early writings. And in the in early writings, Ellen White declared that the Pope has changed the day of rest from the seventh to the first day. He has thought to change the very commandment that was given to cause man to remember his creator. So all, although we might not be able to see, or some people might say we, we cannot see uh, the papacy having any supreme role or anything like that nowadays, we know for a fact that the spirit of prophecy has declared that the Pope in the future will change or, or will think to change the day of rest to the first day. And why? And, and what is that? What, what is he actually doing? He is 
thinking to change the commandment that was given to cause man to remember his creator. So if anything that is there in the world that is, that is, that is distracting people from creation or, or distracting people from the creator and pointing people to the creation is something related to the agenda of the papacy. And we find that many environmental organizations have arose and many, and countries also are in, in the idea of green movements and things like that. Focusing on preserving the earth, of course, they're not actually interested in preserving the earth, but and the face uh, in, in public, they want to preserve the earth, but they want to forget about their creator. Uh, in great controversy, what Ellen White has declared is that through the two great errors, the immortality of the soul and Sunday sacredness, Satan will bring people under his deceptions. So this is what, this is, through this, Satan will bring people under deception. Now we have to remember one thing, and that is, it is deception. What does deception mean? It means you don't easily, you're not easily able to see it on, I mean, face value. It's a deception. So if, if we are, if we are, if, if, if some of us feel agitated about something or the other that's happening on the earth, it is a deception. So it's something that will seem very, very close to the truth and even something that's really good, but it will it is something that uh, will deceive. But what what is what what will what will Satan use to bring his people under his deception? Sunday sacredness and immortality of the soul. Of course, Sunday sacredness. We might say, okay, people are not Christians, so they don't care. But immortality of the soul is very much present in this time. If you look at different shows. Uh, you will see that immortality of the soul is taught. People in shows don't like to show death. They like to show people resurrecting. They like to be, uh, show people having many lives. And the idea in the public is that people don't die. People live from one state to the other. So with these two, two great errors, we can see that Satan will bring his deception. So anything, anything that is teaching us or, allow, or making us comfortable with the idea that death isn't something real, death is not a problem, and uh, there is life after death in the sense that the soul is immortal, that we as human beings are immortal and that we don't die. That is very much present in our society today. We won't go into that, but we, we have to recognize that it is there. People don't, do not like the idea to think that after death, there's nothing. They want to have the idea that there's life, but without God and without his rules. Another thing that, was, that is mentioned in Selected Messages, Volume 3, is that in the warfare to be waged in the last days, they will be united in a opposition to God's people, all the corrupt powers that have apostatized from allegiance to the law of Jehovah. In this warfare, the Sabbath of the fourth commandment will be the great point at issue, for in the Sabbath commandment, the great lawgiver identifies himself as the creator of the heavens and the earth. So it is a Sabbath that is something that will be an issue at the end time. But how? How is a Sabbath to be an issue? Why is Sunday such a big issue? What is the Sabbath? The Sabbath is something to do with character. It, this, the Sabbath is not a sign just simply because we go to church on Sabbath. Uh, People who go to church on Sabbath are not immune to the mark of the beast. People who go to church on Sabbath are not immune to the mark of the beast. Who are those that are 
immune to the mark of the beast. Those who have the character of God. And those who are forgiven by God. Those who live holy lives. They are the ones who, first of all, can keep the Sabbath. And they are the ones who can be uh, or who are protected from the mark of the beast. So if you look at our current times today, we find that there are many things that are going around, like uh, so many things that the government is forcing us to do, putting vaccines and things like that. But does that have anything to do with character? Does that have anything to do with our relationship with God? Does that prevent ourselves, our minds from focusing on God? Do the things that the government, are the things that the government are doing right now, forcing us to do certain things, preventing us from seeing God? If, it, if, if they are not, then it is not an issue yet. Because the issue, according to the spirit of prophecy, is the Sabbath, is character, is that, is, is, is that allegiance to God. Through whatever the government is forcing us to do, if it causes us to uh, show ourselves uh, as enemies of God, then it is something that is breaking the Sabbath. Why? Because uh, whatever, whatever, the, those who can keep the Sabbath are only those who are saved. People who are not saved, people who are living in sin, cannot keep the Sabbath. They cannot rest. Why? Because they, they're in bondage. They're, they're in evil. They're in sin. So when all of this is happening, how can someone, how can someone be at rest? No, they cannot. So when you look at what, what the mark of the beast is, it is not simply something that is physical. It might, it might have something physical. It might not. But what we as Christians are supposed to be worried about is that, is it altering my mind so that I will not follow the will of God? If it is not, then we don't have to worry. If, if it is preventing us from acting out our own conscience in, in a way that, like for example, Daniel, did, did many of the things that the Babylonians do uh, uh, go against Daniel's beliefs? Yes. What did Daniel do? He did not simply rebel against the government, did he? But when the government said, you shall worship the, the, the king for 30 days, what did Daniel do? He went and he prayed three times a day. So, of course, we have to understand it is a deception. But at the same time, it has something to do with our relationship with God. If, the, if, if whatever the government is forcing us to do is not altering our relationship with God, then it, it, the mark of the beast has yet to come. So let us remember here, what does Revelation say? Revelation says that he causeth all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads. You can say on also and translate in that way, but we can see what, what is happening here. They're receiving an engraving. They're receiving a carving. And according to Jeremiah, it is a car, uh, God declared that they, their sin is carved. And when you look at Revelation 13, what is the character of the beasts? They're blasphemous. They're, they're going against God. They hate everything that is to do with God. They want to go against God. And they are engraving that whatever, whatever, they, whatever identity they have, whatever rules they have, they're using all their power to engrave this kind of ideo ideology upon the small, the great, the rich, the poor, the free, and the bond, all of them. And in verses before, we find that the whole world marvels after the beast. And then the beast makes an image. And an image also has, to, has something to do with 
engraving and carving and things like that. So what is happening here? The beast is making sure that everyone in this world will receive this mark. This engraving, this, this impress. So which means what? It is something that if, if it has to do with character, what does it have to do? It has to do with habits. So what kind of habits do you have? What do you do every day? Those who are faithful to God every day will not have to worry about the mark of the beast. Why are we worrying about the mark of the beast when God is the ruler of all? Did Daniel have to worry about the, what Babylon and Medo-Persia and Greece are going to do when he saw the vision? What did Daniel declare when he saw the vision in chapter 2 of Daniel? He said, Lord, you are the one who sets up kings and removes kings. Can we as Christians say the same thing? Because Daniel had faith, he did not have to worry about anything. Because he knows that God is in control. God is in charge. So if you have given your life to Christ, you have given and said, God, I am yours. Whatever you want me to do, I will do. Is there any reason for us to be worried about whether we are receiving the mark or not? In fact, if there's anything and we are close to God, God himself will impress upon our minds the truth that we need to know. Because he's concerned about us. Do you believe that God is concerned about you and cares about you? If God cares about you, why do you have to worry? You'll only have to worry if you desire to live a life of sin and at the last moment want to change. That is the only time that you have to worry. But when you look at what is happening here, this is what happens. The whole world, the whole world, of course, we know now the governments have more control over the population than ever before. But at the same time, we have to remember that unless the government is playing with our conscience, the time has not yet come, but will come very soon. And when it comes, we have to be ready. How are we to be ready? We will see soon. But whatever we have seen in Revelation 13, what is it? What 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 we can we conclude? We can conclude that uh, one way of looking at it is that Babylon is is engraving Babylonian character in the forehead or in the hand. If you look at what has happened during the pandemic, many people have been at their homes. And what exactly have they been doing? Have they been doing things that build character or have they been doing things that degrade character? If majority of the world are doing things that degrade character, then what is actually happening? The image of the beast or the character of Babylon is being engraved upon their minds, or if, if not their minds, at least their actions are Babylonian. They're evil, they're wicked, they're sinful. I don't know if, how many of you have been involved in activities like this, but just think about it in, in your own mind. Anything that is related to Babylonian character is related to the mark of the beast. Uh, whatever Babylon is like, whatever the media is showing that does not allow you to practice the character of God, that's Babylonian. The movies that show a character that is not of God, but of the devil is Babylonian. The games that talk, show the character of the devil and not of God is Babylonian. The music that uh, shows the character of the devil and not of God is Babylonian. And so we can see that the whole world is actually prepared to and are ready to receive the character of Babylon already. And many people who claim to be people of God are also in that same, are, are involved in that same kind of activity, Babylonian activity. And so as they do these activities every day, what is happening? The character of Babylon is being engraved upon their foreheads to the point that they cannot keep the Sabbath. Why? Because they, their, their habits, 
their mind, their thoughts are in such a way that Sabbath means nothing to them, nothing to them. And even if they want to keep the Sabbath, they, they don't want to give up their sin. So, and what does it mean when you're not wanting to give up your sin? You want to be greater than God. You want, and it's doing the same thing that Babylon herself is doing. So engraving Babylonian character upon the forehead or in their hand is, is what, what we can see. One of the conclusions we can have from this chapter. So the, what, what, is, what is here? We can conclude that the beast powers desire to engrave blasphemy and defiance in character and action. If we are showing defiance toward God and desire to show defiance to authority, to our parents and things like that, that is, that, that is, that is forming our character. That is part of our actions. And so we can see here, the beast power's desire to engrave blasphemy and defiance in character and action. And that is what the whole world doesn't know this. It, the whole world does not know what the beast is planning to do. But we as Christians, we as Adventists know that the beast desires to have its character upon our, upon our, uh, uh, upon our character and upon our action. So when we, when we go to the next chapter, we find the habit of the faithful, the character of the faithful is declared there. What is that? that they are guarding the commandments of God, they are keeping the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus with endurance. That's a character of the faithful. And you have to see whether you fit in that category or not. Are you guarding the commandments of God? Are you keeping the commandments of God and having the faith of Jesus, the faith which Jesus had with endurance, not giving up? That is the character of the faithful. That is the character of people who will not receive the mark of the beast. Anyone who, has, who does not have this kind of character, no matter, what, no matter what kind of gymnastics they try to do, will receive the mark of the beast. Even if you don't, even if you do not, even if you do not accept what the government is giving you, if you're not guarding the commandments of God and having the faith of Jesus with endurance, there is no hope for you. You will receive the mark, no matter what. Because what? You don't care about God. You don't care about his law. You don't care about anything. You don't care about his people. You only care about yourself. So, why, why should God torture you in heaven if that's what you want? God is not going to, God is not going to force us to be in heaven a place that we don't want to be. But God knows that those who guard the commandments of God and have the faith of Jesus with endurance do want him and do want his character, do want his seal, do want his name on their foreheads. And they are the ones that will be saved. So the mark of the beast is not something to worry about. But it is something to to be wary about. It's not to be worried about. We don't worry about the mark of the beast because at least as faithful people, it is not something to worry about. Because God is the one that will help us if we submit ourselves to him. God will help us be faithful. But if we don't want, if we if we don't want to submit to him, then there is no, there's there is no there is no opportunity for us to uh, not receive the mark. Those who do not submit themselves to God through prayer and Bible study and dedication and, uh, and earnest, sincere uh, Christian life uh, will have no hope because they, first of all, deceive themselves and they deceive the world. Um, just like, just like the, only the person who has slept well can function well the next day. You can't expect someone who has not slept for two days 
to function well and good. So the same thing. Those who are faithful to God, those who keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus with endurance are the ones who will not receive the mark of the beast. So let us give ourselves to God. Let us dedicate our lives to God and let him lead us. Let us remember whatever the world does, if it, let us remember that let it, let it not affect our character and the relationship that we have with God. If it does, we should push it away. Anything that the world gives us that prevents us from having a relationship with God uh, should be put away. That's what you see even when Ellen White talks about diet. It has nothing to do with having some kind of uh, cult uh, following or anything like that. It has to do with a relationship with God. She says that some people with certain diets cannot appreciate the atonement, the sacrifice that Jesus has made. So what is important? What is God concerned about? He's concerned about character. He's concerned about our habits. He's concerned about our thought process, and that is it. What is, why, why is the Revelation declaring something like this in chapter 13? It is only so that we know that God is in control and that we don't have to worry. We don't have to worry. The faithful don't have to worry because they are the ones that keep the commandments of God and have the faith of Jesus. But who are the ones who need to worry? The ones who don't want the commandments of God and don't have the faith of Jesus. Because that's what Revelation 13, 16 says. That he causeth all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads. Which means our neighbors around us, our friends around us, might receive it. Our family members, even people in our own house, I'd receive it without us knowing. Of course, it's not necessarily right now, but if we are in the habit of living in sin, then all of us who are in the habit of living in sin will receive the mark of the beast. That's what God does not want. <clears throat> that is why in Revelation 14, God declared, fear God, and in, in a very like, as if God is creating a new people, Fear God and give glory to him for the hour of his judgment has come. Why? Because he, that's the kind of people that he needs. That's the kind of people that he wants. The others don't want him. So Jesus cannot do anything for them. So that, that, is, that is what we have for this evening. I hope that we will remember this text. That the whole world, the whole world will be, will, will go under this mark. Will go under this what? It's not just simply a mark, but it is an impress. It, it, is a, it is an engraving. It is something that cannot be removed. So which means, when, when you look at what the Bible is saying now, uh, those who receive the mark will be thrown into the, or will be burned in, in fire and brimstone. What does it mean? It means that their characters are so evil or, or the character of the Satan or evil characters so ingrained into their minds that God can't do anything about it. Because they made their choice. So through our own choices, we can come to a point, just like Judas, even though he would live in the presence of Jesus, to come to that point. And th that's what it means. So when we see in Revelation 14, those who receive the mark on their forehead or in their hands, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of the of fornication with the presence of God and the angels and the lamb. It only means that their, their minds, their characters, whatever, their hand, their forehead, it's all, it's, it's all been an, <clears throat> carved, all been impressed by the character of the devil or the character of the beast, the agenda of the beast, the, the doctrine of the beast. If you, look, if you look at the doctrine the Catholic Church is putting out today, it is very secular. It doesn't look like it's some religious agenda, does it? It doesn't. 
But if 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 we as Christians, as Adventists, live secular lives, we're doing the same thing they're doing. So it's no different. Let us remember this. Whatever we are doing, let us not follow the let us not follow Babylon. Let us follow God. Let us keep the commandments of God and have the faith of Jesus. And then we, we're safe. Let us be grateful to God that God has warned us about what will happen in the future. And let us study his word, the spirit of prophecy. Of course, let us not let us pray that God will help us not be fanatical and uh, focus on things that are not important. Let us focus on what Christ has done, what Christ is doing in the sanctuary, and the privilege that God has given us through his blood. And how we can share the message that we know to others. That's what we need to be focused on. Not on some trivial things that have nothing to do with our character. Let us, let, may God help us as we, as we, um, as, as we make decisions, important decisions in our lives today. Because uh, n more than anyone else, even more than yourself, God is concerned about your character. So let us bow our heads and close this with uh, a prayer. Let us dedicate our lives to God today, to him, so that he will be able to help us. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Our most kind and gracious Father in heaven, we thank you for the message that you've given us this evening about the mark of the beast. Lord, some of us are scared. Some of us are frightened about what will happen in the future. But you have given us the assurance that if we are faithful to you, if we are focused on you, if we are keeping the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus with endurance through your power and your grace, there is no need for us to fear. But Lord, for some of us who desire to live a life of sin, let us fear, let us be scared so that we can run to you, have our lives changed. Lord, let us put away everything that is related to Babylon. In a sense, let us remove everything that impresses the character of Babylon on our lives so that we will stand, we will be able to stand for you and show the world that there's no other better being in the universe except you. May your love fill our hearts and our lives and may us and our family members all see your character, your greatness as you have revealed in your word. Thank you for your love. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.